We're at a sales and marketing conference, obviously. So last <laughs> night when we were, when we were talking, I, I got to thinking that I think in a lot of ways, sales is the dirty job of a lot of businesses. Sure. You know, people don't like salespeople. They have a, they have a bad rep, reputation. It's kind of scummy. People like marketing. Marketing is sort of branding and imaging, and that's fun. But selling, where you got to get in front of a customer and handle objections and ask for that order. Like, so I kind of think sales is the dirty job well, of Well, that's business. where the actual work is. Right. That's so, the wet work. Right, exactly. And we talked about that a little bit last night. So. Um, Tell me about uh, QVC, because I, I, you and I had, well, the reason, no, this is great, you guys should really seriously watch his QVC. The reason I hired you to come here, I read how you pitched the pencil. Mm. And I said, this is a dude I gotta have on my stage, you know, from that, because I, I'm, I think that you're a poet warrior in the sense of how you tell stories and how you communicate, and you are a, pitch man of a different kind, but you're still in sales. So talk a little bit about that. Did you just call me a poet warrior? I think so. That's awesome. I love, <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what? I, I mean, really those kinds of big epic juxtapositions, mm -hmm. I love that there's a, there's a play called uh, The Curious Savage. It's the same kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. You know, combining, you know, heads and tails, two sides of the same coin and all that. For me, in, the first steady gig I ever had in television was hawking things uh, on the graveyard shift at the QVC cable shopping channel. And um, <laughs> that happened in 1989. I was actually singing, I was singing, for, I was singing in the opera, in, in the Baltimore opera. And, um, and I heard about this, uh, this audition we were in the middle of a production, actually, of something called uh, Deringdus Nibelungen, which is a Wagnerian dirge. I can't, uh, I can't dissuade you from saying strongly enough. Um, <laughs> but there was an intermission in the middle of this thing, and then I didn't have to be on stage for like another hour after the intermission. So I, I, I had an hour and 20 minutes to kill, so I walked over to the uh, Mount Royal Tavern uh, dressed as a Viking to watch the back half of the football game. It's subtle. <laughs> I mean, I literally walk across, I mean, I, I am dressed as a Viking. I walk into the bar and my friend Rick uh, gets me a beer and I look up, but the game's not on. He's watching a big guy in a shiny suit sell pots and pans. And I said, what the hell is this? And he goes, well, this is this home shopping thing. This is 1989, right? Mm -hmm. He says, they're in town and they're having an open audition tomorrow and I'm going to go down and, uh, you know, audition for that guy's job. He was a fellow actor, this bartender. And so I sat there and I looked at it and we started to talk about what was clearly the end of Western civilization, <laughs> you know. But then I realized, I said, you know what, I, I, I bet I could do that. And he said, I bet you can't. And I said, I got 100 says I can get a call back. So the next morning, I go down to the Stouffer Hotel mm -hmm. in the Inner Harbor in Baltimore to audition mm -hmm as a show host for QVC, and I think the story you're talking about, that number two Ticonderoga pencil, mm -hmm. I, walked into the, uh, I walked into the conference room, and a guy named John Eastman had a camera pointed at me, and the camera's over his shoulder, and I'm sitting right in front of it like this, and he says, uh, the audition is very simple. I'm going to hand you a pencil. I want you to talk about the pencil. I want you to make me want the pencil. I want you to leave me with the categorical certainty that this pencil is the most important thing on planet Earth. Do not stop talking about the pencil until I tell you to. And that's, that was the thing. And he pulled a pencil behind his ear, rolled it across the table, and I picked it up, and I started talking about it. The interesting thing, looking back on all that, is it, it, it was such a hard job to recruit for mm -hmm. because who do you hire? You know, you hire a TV guy who doesn't know anything about sales. You hire a sales guy who doesn't know anything about TV. It was, a, it was a weird mix of skills that were required, but the fundamental skill was just kind of bullshit, right? I mean, can, can you talk about a pencil for eight minutes? As it turns out, I could. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
So tell me, how did you study? Did, did you just pick it up? I mean, like I, you and I were talking last night, and I can't help but think that there has been some study. You, you're, you're in- well, I mean, I, when I was in college, I paid for it by selling magazines over the phone okay. for a company called uh, Dial America Marketing. This was another one of those jobs you realize, oh, crap, I'm not bad at this. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> b- but I, I, was, I was deeply concerned for my immortal soul, you know. Uh, I'm calling you during dinner on behalf of big brothers and big sisters and trying to talk you into taking six months of Time magazine. Uh, that, that See, was, I was selling six months of frozen meat. The meat? Yeah. With the freezers. Exactly. You sell the meat, then you sell the freezer. And I was calling it dinner time, trying, yep. It's tough, right? And I yeah. also... And I wasn't bad at it. That's, it, it's, <laughs> it's really one of the most chilling lessons to realize you're good at something you hate or, or you're bad at something you love, you know? It's like what we always say on Dirty Jobs, you know, just, j- just because you're passionate about something doesn't mean you can't suck at it. And the world's full of that too, right. you know? But uh, so Dial America Marketing led to a gig at Computerland. You guys might remember Com- Computerland, right? Oh my God, they're clapping for Computerland in the history. Of, what are they called now? System Source or something like that. I was, I was negotiating uh, service contracts at the same time I was singing in the opera for Computerland. I didn't know anything about computers, but man, I understood the, the drama of what happens when a thing you rely upon breaks. Mm-hmm. So the IBM PC, the XT, the AT, the Brunulli box, remember the, remember the Iomega Brunulli box, the Epson printers, like all this old, it's cluttered in the yeah. useless part of my brain, you know, the same part of my brain that told me to duck that I ignored. Yeah. It's called a callback, yeah. So, but, you know, negotiating service contracts, selling magazines, the thing I took from that that was useful was a, a feature benefit approach to life. Mm -hmm. So in sales, anyway, for me, you know, if somebody hands you a pencil, you can say it's a number two Ticonderoga pencil, and and then you're done, and then you never get hired to to work on QVC, which could be a blessing. Uh, Or you say it's yellow. That's the feature. The benefit is why? Why is it yellow? Because your desk drawers are cluttered, and when you open your drawer and look down, you need to locate that pencil with all due speed. You're a busy person. You don't have time to rifle through your drawer. You want that canary yellow to pop, and you want to bring out that pencil and fill out your purchase order and get on with your life. That's why it's yellow. Why is it number two? I'll tell you why, because number three is too damn hard, and number one is too damn soft. Right. (laughs) You want a number two? My whole career turned out to be based on number two. (laughs) I want a number two pencil, right? You ever notice the eraser at the end of the pencil? Of course it's there, but why is it as long and as thick as it is? I'll tell you why. Study after study indicates a person who maximizes his potential, his pencil to its fullest potential, after sharpening it and using it, that eraser is designed to last exactly as long as the lead in the pencil. It's not a mistake. Scientific. And I'll tell you something else, Red, it's not lead. (laughs) It's graphite from Madagascar. Why? Because Madagascar graphite, time after time again, proves to be longer lasting. And if you tend to lick the end of your pencil, as some people do for reasons I can't entirely explain, the graphite won't kill you. (laughs) The lead will. So this is, I'm selling this thing. (laughs) And, and, and I'm, I, I, I go on for four minutes, and, 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 and he's not stopping me. So then I started to think not in terms of features and benefits in the corporal realm, but what really has a pencil done for Western civilization? Well, I'll tell you something. Albert Einstein came up with the theory of relativity. You know what he wrote it down with? Pencil. <laughs> Imagine a world where we don't understand the implications of E and MC squared. Imagine if he didn't have that pencil handy when the moment of inspiration watched over him. Maybe he would have forgotten, and maybe now we wouldn't be able to talk about time travel and all that cool crap. I don't know, but I'll tell you something else about the pencil. The first love note I ever wrote to Heather Klebe in the eighth grade, number two, Ty Gonderoga. (laughs) She responded to me. So in the end, it's never about the pencil. It's always about 
the thing you can do with the thing you're talking about. 